This is the case for an Altair 8800, and it is by far one of the most iconic and instantly recognizable, and dare I say, I feel it's the most beautiful machine in existence. And in full transparency, this is not a real case, because if it was, there's no way I would be doing what I'm about to do with this, which is use it to house my relay computer project. And if my rudimentary measuring skills are up to par, then I should be able to fit all of those cards into this machine as long as I build a new, more space-efficient backplane. But before going into that, I want to talk about the front panel, because this is really our user interface that we're going to use to enter or load new code into the Relay computer, as well as run that code and see the results of that code. And then we would also want to have some sort of status of the control lines so we can really see what's going on inside the Relay computer. In order to get a good look at the front panel, I'm going to remove it from the case. And compared to more modern PC cases, this one is really easy to get into. It's just these two screws at the top rear of the cover, and then a quick shift just to make some room for the cover, which comes off easy peasy. The front panel assembly is held in place by these two sets of nuts and screws on the bottom left and right sides of the cabinet. And with a quick flip of the cabinet on its side, these are easily taken care of. And now that the assembly is loose, I'll very carefully pull the front panel from the cabinet, and then I'll stop to admire it before getting it ready for a snapshot that I'll use to explain the front panel in more detail. The Altair 8800 front panel can be divided into two sections. The top half that consists of all the indicators to tell us what's going on, and then the bottom half that has all of the toggle switches for the various functions that can be performed. And I'll take a moment here to talk about how the display and first row of switches are spaced out in sets of three. The designers use this octo layout to simplify data entry, which can be seen in this example from the Altair manual. But the key features that we are interested in today are the indicators representing the current memory address, the data value at that current address, and the switches that will allow us to alter those values. And in order to look at or change the values in memory, we will need these four functions. The examine through to the deposit next functions on the original Altair were used to greatly improve the ease of entering or reviewing programs and data. And on the Altair, these front panel switches actually activate an injection of instructions onto the data bus to make them work. In the Relay computer world, Paul Law has recreated this sort of functionality by generating the control signal pulses to create these five functions. And since I want to model my front panel functions to those on the Altair, I'll need to combine these first two and also change up the order of the examine and deposit next functions. So let's start with the examine function. Examine will take whatever value is currently on the toggle switches and load the program counter or address with that value. It then displays whatever value is at that memory address. The control signals are pretty straightforward since we just need to read the switches, load the program counter, read memory when the program counter address is still on the address bus, and then load the instruction register which is used to display the value. The deposit function simply allows us to put a data value onto the current memory address. It uses the data value on these toggle switches and the rest are ignored as it's only depositing it to the current memory address that is displayed here. To do this, it selects the program counter and the data switches and then gates the data to the memory card. And while it's doing all of that, 
It also loads the instruction register, which displays the value, and writes the data value to memory. This is where things start to get a bit more interesting. The examine next function doesn't use what's on the switches, but rather it uses the current program counter address and advances it by one. Then it displays the value from that new address. And this all requires a few more control signals, starting with selecting the incrementer and loading the program counter to advance it by one. It then selects the program counter, reads the value from memory, and loads the instruction register to display that value, and then finally loads the incrementer for the next round. And finally, we have the deposit next function, which takes the current data switch's value, advances the current program counter address by one, and then writes that data value to that new address. And this one wins the award for most control signals needed by first selecting the incrementer, data switches, and then gating that data value to the memory card. And while that's happening, the instruction register and program counter are updated, and the value is written to memory. And then it selects the program counter and loads the incrementer so it's ready for the next function. The initial work on the ring counter slash sequencer and pulse generation went fairly quickly because these have become common circuits in the relay computer. But when I was working on the examine next function, I started getting these strange results in the program counter, like in this example where it should have incremented to 1100 instead of 1110. Because the value was also showing incorrectly on the incrementer, I made the big assumption that it must be a problem with that card. So I started probing around and I did find a shorted flyback diode and thought that must definitely be the culprit. So after some minor surgery, I did a quick manual check to confirm that the incrementer was working properly. But once it was all together again, the same problem was still happening. I picked up a great tip when watching Paul's video, which is to do a slow motion capture of the problem, and this quickly revealed the root cause. Let's play it back and I'll pause here. There is a ripple carry action that occurs during each incrementation which I think is causing the trouble here. Looking back at the sequence of events, the program counter is being selected and the load incrementer is occurring at the same time. But the incrementer needs this time, which is just a few milliseconds, to generate and load the new value. Paul Law had a similar problem with timing, and he solved it by chaining relays together which takes advantage of the few milliseconds it takes for a relay to activate, thus creating a short delay. And with that problem solved, it was back to populating the board and installing the multitude of diodes. These diodes are needed to ensure that we don't have any backfeeding occurring between the sequencer, the pulse generator, and the control lines to the relay computer. Now, I'm still using the loose jumper wires when creating the board, only because I can ensure everything is working before I create the cleaner version. But in this case, I had already nicely covered up the diodes on the examine function before I realized that I needed to add an extra control line to ensure that the examine and deposit next functions are starting from the right memory address. So this meant a bit of delicate open board surgery to remove the old jumper, install the additional diode, wire all of that back together, and then make the connection to the load incrementer control line. Well, after a few late nights and a lot of coffee, I bring you these first four front panel control functions 
which are the examine, deposit, examine next, and deposit next. So let's start with a quick tour before we put it through its paces. Starting on the left is the six step sequencer, which uses a simple ring counter circuit, I guess minus the ring because it actually doesn't feed the last step back to the first step. And these six capacitors dictate the speed of this counter circuit. And right now these are a thousand microfarad capacitors, which are large enough just to keep things running a bit slower for now while I'm still testing and debugging this thing. And this sequencer circuit is used to generate these four pulses that we need and above those are these relays that are helping to offset the timing for the pulses that we talked about earlier. Now I'll jump over to these functions over here, all of which have this bottom relay that is used to latch the function when the button is pushed. And this just keeps the function active until the first five sequencer steps are completed. And then the sixth sequencer step activates this relay that then resets the latches on all of the functions. And then the remaining top relays and diodes for each function are routing the pulses to the appropriate control lines to make the function actually happen on the relay computer. And we can see that these functions get more complicated between say the examine function versus the deposit next function just based on the number of relays and diodes needed for each of these functions. Now all of these functions with the exception of the examine next would be using the switches on the front panel for address and data information which I don't have set up yet. So I've just included a couple of very low tech wires that I can use during the testing just to temporarily change the address and the data values. Now I'll switch to the second camera so we can take a quick look at the relay computer where we should see the data values showing up on the instruction register here and then the address value will be showing up in behind on the program counter card here. So let's power it up and see what we see. Once there's power, we can see that we're starting with a zero in the program counter and then nothing yet for the data until we hit the examine button. And now we can see this value, which is the current byte located at address zero in memory. And this value wasn't put into memory, and it's showing because the static RAM typically has some random data in memory when it's powered up. So this value happens to be whatever value was in memory address zero. And it won't happen once I move to capacitor memory, but it's actually kind of a bonus right now since it gives us some values to look at while testing these functions. So I'll go ahead and press examine again and we can see it pulling the same value which makes sense because the address is still pointing at zero. But if I apply some power to the first address bit and then hit examine again we can see that the program counter now reflects the memory address of one and it's now displaying the data value from that address. And if I set the address back to zero and hit examine again, we can see that we are back to the original value that we had from address zero. So let's deposit a new value in this address. And I'll use this wire to power the eighth bit on the data bus. And when I hit deposit, we can see that the new data value appears. And when I disconnect that data line and press examine, we can see that the new value is actually in address zero. But what if we want to do a deposit into a specific address? Well, just like the Altair, we would first make sure that the address we want is in the program counter. So we would set the address, hit the examine, and then perform the deposit in that location. 
And because I had the data set to zero at this point, it would deposit nothing into that. So that is correct. So I'll go ahead and set that eighth bit to high and perform the deposit again. And there we go. Now that's good if we just need to look at or change a specific byte in memory, but it would get a bit tedious if we needed to look at some program code or even enter a new program into memory. And that's where these next two functions really shine. Looking at the program counter, we can see that we're still at address one. And if we want to simply look at what's in the next address, then we can use the examine next function. And this automatically increments the address and then pulls the data value from that new address. So this is really handy when you want to step through a program or data in memory. And once we're done and we need to jump to a specific address, then we can just use the examine function, which in this case would set the address back to zero. The final function is the deposit next, and you've probably already guessed what this function does. We can see that our eighth bit in address zero is still here from when we deposited it previously. So to make this function more obvious, I'm going to set the seventh bit on the data bus, and then I'm going to hit the deposit next. And then just for fun, I'll move it to the sixth bit ever so delicately, and then hit deposit next. And why not? We'll do it one more time and I will set the fifth bit and deposit next. Then I'll clear the data bus and hit examine to take us back to address zero where we see our eighth bit still hanging out there. And now if I use the examine next, we can see that we have those same values we entered in sequence using the deposit next function. My rollout schedule for my videos is three weeks. And you might ask, well, why not two or one? And that's because I'm kind of new at this and I want to allow myself the time to make sure I get the video quality the way I'd like it to be before it comes out. But this was the first video that I was actually concerned towards this ending that I wasn't going to make it because I was running into some issues with this board in terms of the diodes uh, burning out and also just the timing issues that I talked about previously. Now there is still a ton of testing that I need to do before I commit to a PCB design for this front panel user interface. But I'm having a blast putting this all together and I hope that you are as well. So I'll take this opportunity to thank you so much for watching and I'll leave off with a slightly quicker version of this using some smaller capacitors.